Good morning. Welcome to our second Sunday in Advent. And our reading this morning is from Luke chapter 1. It's from verse 5 through to the end of verse 56. Now today's sermon is called Trust When It's Hard, Trust When You Don't Understand, and Trust When You're Not Sure. Trust I don't knock the microphone off. That would be a good start, wouldn't it? From verse 5. In the days of King Herod of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Both of them were righteous before God, living blamelessly according to all the commandments and the regulations of the Lord. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were getting on in years. Once, when he was serving as priest before God and his section was on duty, Zechariah was chosen, according to Lot, and to the custom of the priesthood to go and enter the sanctuary of the Lord and offer incense. Now at the time of incense offering, the whole assembly of the people were praying outside. Then there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was terrified and fear overwhelmed him. But the angel said, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will name him John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He must never drink wine or drink strong drink, and even before his birth, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. He will turn many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. With the spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of the parents to their children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know this is so? For I am an old man, and my wife is getting on in years. The angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. But now, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time, you will become mute unable to speak until the day these things occur. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondered at his delay in the sanctuary. When he did come out, he could not speak to them, and they realized he'd seen a vision in the sanctuary. He kept motioning to them and remained unable to speak. When his time of service was ended, he went to his home. And those days his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she remained in seclusion. She said, this is what the Lord has done for me when he looked favor favorably upon me and took away the disgrace I've endured among my people. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and he said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered, what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and you will bear a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be? since I am a virgin. The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born, will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, here I am, the servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the whole country where she entered the house of Zechariah and she greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. 
And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Well, on this Sunday of Advent, this second Sunday, I wanted to look a little bit at Luke's testimony of the lives of Mary and Elizabeth. And I want to specifically consider from what Luke writes, something that I hope will give us encouragement and give us um, a sense of trust in this season that we're in. We, we've heard the word of the Lord and we say thanks be to the Father for it. Well, look, as I said, we're looking at two women, two women who are different and yet the same, related family. And God comes in and does something among them. The first one of them is Elizabeth. We know from Luke's testimony that she was old when these things come to pass. She, the scriptures teach us, was faithful as she ran her home while Zechariah served in the temple, faithful in all that she did when he was there, faithful in all that she did before God. Blameless they were, the scriptures say, blameless in the commands of the Lord. Well, both she and Zechariah had served, uh, um, served the Lord. And these were a pair, a couple, who were looking for the fulfillment of God's kingdom come. We see, as we read, that they were from the tribe of Levi. Luke emphasizes their blamelessness. Luke makes sure that we know this. And this is very important that we understand that um, Luke expresses that she could not conceive, but it was not because of an issue between her and God. It was not because of sin. She was, she was unable to bear children. And in their culture, this was a public shame. This was a shame where people would have judged her, where people would have looked at her every time she came through for decades of her life, where they would have expected as she got married to Zechariah probably when she was young, that she would have one day conceived a child and they would have seen her with a baby um, nursing it inside her. And they would have been like, oh, there's Elizabeth, there's Zechariah, the family is growing, but there was nothing. And this went on for generations, or sorry, decades, not generations. This went on um, and carried a great stigma with it. But, and lots of people, they would have assumed. They would have assumed that there was sin, that God was holding children back because there was something wrong in, in her walk. But that's not, the, that's not the fact. The fact is, she was unable to have it, and yet she was blameless. She was unable. God kept them until the right time. These were blameless people. And then look, the second one is Mary. Mary is not old, but she is young. She is heading towards her marriage with Joseph. She's preparing herself. Perhaps she'd been finishing off her bridal dress. Perhaps she'd been learning the ropes of um, a household and how she would run their household whilst they were married and Joseph was doing his carpentry work. You know, the Bible tells us that uh, in other places that, that both her and Joseph were from the tribe of Judah. The Bible explains, we don't know why, that um, in the past her family had left their homelands in Judah and they'd gone into the north and she was living in Nazareth. And I guess the reality is the reason Joseph gets picked to be her husband as the families would have come together was that because he was from their tribe, it's because even though they'd moved on geographically, they wanted somebody they considered close kin, somebody they considered part of their family. So they were matched together. Well, they were matched together for those reasons as, as the families see it. But as we look at it, we know the deeper reason that the, that the Lord God was bringing his people to a place where they would bring the light of the world safely um, to us. So there she is. She is waiting and preparing. She is being faithful before God. She is looking for God. She's a young servant of the Lord, hoping for his kingdom come. Well, as I prepared for today and prayed and looked at this Christmas season, I felt I should speak on this matter of trust. And as I said to you, as I said to you earlier, I wanted to speak on trust when it's hard, trust when you don't understand, and trust when you're not sure. And that's what the sermon is entitled. And this sermon isn't um, simply a matter of, of trying to expose part of the word and help us to apply it. But this is a sermon that um, creates the opportunity for testimony for you to testify to your brothers and sisters. I'm saying to you as you're listening to this that that door for testimony is open at the end of this um, sermon. I'm actually going to, when I come back on the screen, the other me, not this me, um, when I come back on the screen, I'm actually going to say, look, who's willing to say something about trust 
and their walk of trust with the Lord at the moment? Who's willing to encourage their brothers and sisters to be honest with them and say something about where they are in trusting God? You know, trusting God in these days is no easy thing. I know at times I've struggled over the last months as we've um, had a Anna come into our world, as our family's grown, as we've had Isaac at home for months with um, homeschooling. Like others who've got young family, which I've struggled and that's made me have struggles in my faith as well. It's made me have times where I've been worried. I've been tempted to try and control things, to not always do things in the way I should. It's not been an easy season. But I think it's a good chance for us this morning as we, as we have this Advent season to look at the year that's gone on. And perhaps one or two people might just say a few words. Even if you, your words are this year, I found it really hard to trust God. I appreciate your prayers. You know, let's be honest with our brothers and sisters. Our brethren are here. Our brethren are gathered. We love one another and we, we hide far too much. We say some things we should never say. We talk in ways we should never talk, but we don't often say enough that is good, that is pure, that is noble, and that is encouraging and uplifting. So I'm opening the door to testimony at the end of this. And I know it will bless people if there's testimony. I'm trusting in that. I'm trusting right now. I haven't prepared anything extra. I haven't actually texted anyone ahead of this service to say to them, I'm going to need some testimony. Can you sneak some in the back door? There's nothing prepared. You've just got this warning. So um, I encourage you, if you know you should say something, something simple about trusting the Lord these last few months. If you know that during this sermon, the Lord speaks to you and says you should say this, don't hold that back. Don't deny that. Speak it. Speak it. And whatever we say, we say in love to our family. So there you go. So look, in those ladies' lives, in, the, in Elizabeth's life, in this scripture, and in Mary's life, in this scripture, we see snapshots of their ongoing willingness to trust God, to trust God when it's difficult, to trust God when they don't understand, to trust God when they're not sure. And that's something that I think we need to grasp hold of and be encouraged by. See, Elizabeth's faithfulness and blamelessness in the commandments of the Lord, their testimony to a woman who spent her decades trusting when it was hard, trusting when people behind her back would have said all kinds of things, would have judged her, perhaps trusting even when Zechariah had problems at work at the temple where people would be like, what's wrong with your family? What's your wife really hiding, Zechariah? What's going on? Why have you got no children? She just trusted when she didn't understand. She trusted you know, her culture, because it reckoned women by their reproductive capabilities. I know she's um, in this position where God gives her John. I know she's in this position, um, not just simply because it suits God, but because she was receptive, because she was honest, because she didn't become bitter and twisted by the problems that she faced. It's easy to say um, that she never took matters into her own hands. She never, as the scriptures say, she never disobeyed God. She kept the ordinances and commands of the Lord and the Lord rewarded her. See, many of us um, do that. We take matters into our own hands. We go our own way. We say to God, we can deal with this. You just step back. We're in charge. But instead, Elizabeth bravely and boldly and inspiringly never gives up, never stops believing. And that gift of that pregnancy, that gift of John, that demonstrates this wholly. John wouldn't have been born to her. John wouldn't have been filled with the Holy Spirit from birth if she wasn't ready and right before God the way she was, the way the scriptures say. And it's a wonderful expression of testimony and trust. She worships God, you know, at the end, as you see in, in the end of Luke 1, 24 to 25, she says this, look, this is what the Lord has done for me. This is what the Lord has done for me as he's looked favorably upon me. And he's took away the disgrace I have endured among my people. When we um, have struggles, we have to endure. Elizabeth teaches us that. Well, here's Mary next. Mary's told by the angel Gabriel that she will carry the Messiah. And to be honest, her response is nothing but staggering. And while Mary is not to be worshipped, for only God alone is to be worshipped, Mary is awe-inspiring as a woman. You know, the scriptures tell us in Isaiah that to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Well, as the implications of the message of Gabriel come into Mary's mind, she agrees. She trusts, despite the pain and the weight that she will bear 
that she will uh, recognize that she steps into actual physical danger by um, accepting this word, by saying to, the, saying to God, yes. She doesn't understand how, but she says, let it be as you've said. And the Holy Spirit overshadows her and the baby is born and the baby is born holy, not by human conception, not by the will of a man, John says, but by God. And so there she is in trust with God. See, if, um, as, as, was an inspi- as, as would transpire, when people found out she was pregnant, she faced death even by stoning because they would have assumed, because it wasn't Joseph's, that um, when Joseph would have said to people, it's not my baby, um, we haven't slept together, they would have said Mary would be stoned, her family could disown her, she could end up on the streets begging if she wasn't killed, totally bereft, cast from society in every way. Mary knows it's going to be hard. Mary trusts when she barely understands, when her life is actually on the line. She trusts when she's not sure what will happen next. Well, again, what a lesson that is for us. So easily our trust can slip. Not even when our lives are on the line, but when little things are in front of us, our trust in God can slip. What I wanted to say, as I said a moment ago, I want to open the door now for testimony. I want to say the reason that is the reason um, I do, I'm doing that is because of what Hebrews 4 uh, verse 12 says. It's because it says to us, you know, the word of God indeed is alive and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces and divides soul from spirit and joints from marrow. It's able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the hearts. And before God, no one is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare. And they must hold an account to the one who caused them. The scriptures question us today. They question us and ask us, will we, will we speak of our trust in our Savior, in our Lord God? See, I want to, to do that not because um, I've got no better idea, but because I say I feel led to say, look, let us testify to one another, to draw one another into love that's unencumbered. And so I'm trusting now. Um, that we might have a little testimony. Testimony that shares the moments where in 2020 we've trusted in the Lord, when it's been hard, when we haven't understood, when we don't know where we're going. Testimony that recognizes that sometimes we wobble and waver, but it's God who's lifted us up. Testimony that we confess perhaps that we failed to trust God, but we can see that the Lord is the one who's restoring us. Or even testimony that says we failed. And we feel like we need the, the hand of the Lord because we can pray for one another in a place like that. Well, I want to say one final thing because lots of you are freaked out at this what idea of testimony, this far too much Britishness about us. We're, we're going to speak in church. Just, oh, no. um, you perhaps mute yourselves back when I let you unmute. The shimmy zoom actually lets you unmute because some weeks it doesn't even do that after I tell it to. Even if you're not willing this morning to testify to your brothers and sisters, which you should, do to encourage them to receive their love um, as this year comes to an end i want you all to do something i want you to reflect on where you are in your trust before god in your walk before god i encourage you um, to go on a walk not necessarily physically because you might be saying it's too cold but at least spiritually go on a walk with the lord and reflect upon your year of trust with him i want you to invest the time to reflect on the successes and the failures of the year for you when it's come to trusting in God. And I say that because it will help you grow. You know, people that don't learn from the past are doomed to be failing and repeating the same, the same struggles. Some of us are like the children in Egypt, going around and around the mountain, grumbling, because we're not learning. We're not growing. So take some time to reflect and actually ask some questions and say, how have I trusted the Lord in different ways this year? How have I trusted him for my daily bread? How have I trusted him in gathering um, and loving my brothers and sisters? How have I trusted him in using my gifts and my skills and my talents, the ones he's given for his glory for the sake of his church? How have I worked with him? How has he worked through me? How have I listened to him and responded to what he said? You know, Proverbs 3 tells us to trust in the Lord with all our hearts and to not rely on our own understandings in all our ways acknowledge him and he will make our path straight and to not be wise in our own eyes but to fear the lord and to shun evil see if you're watching this sermon later it's easy for you to now pause it 
and to spend some time reflecting. But if you're watching it live, then I suggest you either come back to it or you actually remember what I've said and you say, I'm going to spend some time reflecting on how I've trusted God in 2020. I encourage you, if you feel willing, to say a few words of testimony uh, as we unmute. And if we have problems with the unmuting, like we did last week, um, let's try and get start waving frantically, like, you know, um, puppets on a, on a Thunderbird show or something. Do something so we can see that you can't unmute. But let's open our mouths now and have some testimony. I'm going to pray. And then after that, the door will be open for us to, to share. And, um, and hopefully that will encourage and edify one another. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Elizabeth and Mary, for the trust that they show, for the trust that they bring, and for the way that they honoured you. Help us, Lord, to reflect and to share and to, um, to step forward as we see this year go and we move towards a new one in our trust of you, in our corporate trust, in our individual trust. Help us, Lord, to continue to be your faithful people where you've called us to be. Amen. Amen. God bless you today.